Good evening and welcome to Entity News. I'm Sue Biamba and for Stefania. Here are today's top stories. The new Republican House is set to vote on a rules package that some say stifles the Speaker's power. What are some of the promises the new Speaker made and how will he handle them? Biden facing backlash over his first trip to the border. What he saw and what did not see on the tightly controlled visit. New emails show the White House allegedly instructed social media companies to censor certain information about COVID vaccines. We hear from a lawyer involved in the lawsuit against the federal government. We'll analyze the scenes from Brazil, where thousands of people breached and ransacked Brazil's Congress, Supreme Court and Presidential Palace. Congress returns for another round of voting, this time over the rules package that governs how the House does its business. How does this affect the power dynamics in Congress? And today's Arlene Richards reports. Kevin McCarthy. After 15 rounds of contentious voting and multiple concessions, new House Speaker Kevin McCarthy holds the gavel. But some say the compromises have weakened his power and handed it over to a small group of Republicans. Tonight, the House votes on a rules package that's quite different from the routine ones voted on in the past. A former congressional candidate explains what makes it so unique. The major difference is that it's giving more power to the individual congressman to be able to make decisions. It, it, it involves being able to put on uh, committees uh, the most important people uh, that we need to be able to make some changes in Congress. It's the start what could be something very historic in stopping uh, the uh, massive amount of government spending, the intrusion upon uh, people's individual liberty, and much more. A key concession in the package allows any one member to call a vote to remove the speaker. If this vote is called, McCarthy would need a majority of 218 votes to remain as House Speaker. Huey said this puts some pressure on McCarthy. He is going to see multiple pressures to be able to um, uh, compromise. He's got this immense pressure of what is called the rhinos, the Republican in name only, the ones who, who uh, uh, will oppose much of what is being done by the conservatives. He said at the same time, McCarthy is being strongly held to make good on his promises to conservatives. Before the vote, Republican members of Congress gave opinions on the new rules package. Chip and I agree that the rules package had to change, and we have been working to change it. I think one thing that I, I'm not on board with is the idea that, you know, you have to guarantee them X number of slots on, on you know, the approves committee or the rules committee. This agreement, if it comes to fruition, will be very good for the country. Has McCarthy given up too much power? He knows how much power he has. He has to, again, navigate the different uh, uh, factions to keep his power. And so you're going to see some compromises. What can we expect from this Republican House? You can expect them taking a look at the use of the federal government to basically put pressure on Twitter and Facebook and Google and Instagram and all the different uh, factions, uh, uh, types of social media, you can see that uh, what's going to happen is the FBI, the Department of Justice, the CIA, all these different bureaus, they're going to be having investigations. Congratulations. We are now Arlene Richards, NTD News. A new report says the IRS continues targeting low-income earners with more audits than high-earning individuals. It's believed the agency does that due to a lack of manpower. A recent report by Syracuse University says the IRS is continuing to audit more low-income groups than billionaires and millionaires. During fiscal year 2022, the rate of income tax audits per 1,000 individuals reportedly stood at 12.7 for the lowest income wage earners and 2.3 for everyone else. This made low income wage earners the taxpayer class with by far the highest audit rates, clocking around five and a half times more than everyone else. 
The report gives a possible explanation for that, saying that low-income wage earners have historically been targeted not because they account for the most tax underreporting, but because they are easy marks in an era when IRS increasingly relies upon correspondence audits, yet doesn't have the resources to assist taxpayers or answer their questions. The report comes as Republicans have said they'll repeal the Biden administration's push to hire 87,000 new IRS agents. The Inflation Reduction Act had set aside $80 billion in funding for hiring the new agents. Only around $3 billion was set aside for taxpayer services, with around $45 billion going for tax enforcement. The move was met with strong resistance from the GOP. Newly released emails allegedly show that social media companies censored certain information on COVID vaccines. They apparently did so after receiving multiple directives from the White House. In May of 2022, Republicans' attorneys general from southern states sued the Biden administration for allegedly pressuring and colluding with social media giants to suppress free speech. Now, just a few days ago, email conversations were released as part of that lawsuit. Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey, who is part of the suit, published the emails on Twitter. They appear to show White House employees instructing social media companies on how to handle information about COVID vaccines, like this email to Twitter, which addresses a post made by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Wanted to flag the below tweet, and I'm wondering if we can get moving on the process for having it removed ASAP. Janine Yunez is involved in the same lawsuit as Attorney General Bailey. Yunez, who represents some of the private plaintiffs in the suit, tells NTD that First Amendment rights prohibit the government from using private companies to censor certain ideas. We had a lot of evidence that this was happening already, but these new emails sort of take it to another level because they show the government really threatening the tech companies, especially here, it's Facebook and Google. In an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, Yunus gave an example of such strong language allegedly used by the White House after Facebook didn't take the desired measures to censor a certain post. A White House employee apparently wrote an email to Facebook saying, we are gravely concerned that your service is one of the top drivers of vaccine hesitancy, period. We want to know that you're trying, we want to know how we can help, and we want to know that you're not playing a shell game. This would all be a lot easier if you would just be straight with us. Now another thing that's being revealed with these new emails is that according to Yunez, the government previously said that social media companies actually wanted to stop the spread of so-called misinformation on vaccines, and that the government and social media had the same goals, which turns out not to be true. These emails show that in the beginning of 2021, the companies really were not censoring as much. They were not censoring people for so-called COVID misinformation to this degree. And uh, the government, this, especially this Rob Flaherty in the White House, took it to another level. She says these are clearly First Amendment violations and that they hope a court will recognize this with the ongoing lawsuit. NTD reached out to the White House for comment, but didn't hear back before broadcast. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. President Biden is in Mexico today following a controversial trip to the southern border. And today's Iris Tao has more. For the first time in nine years, a U.S. president in Mexico. Biden's in Mexico City today meeting with leaders of Mexico and Canada. And the meeting comes as Biden's facing backlash over his first trip to the U.S. southern border. Stopping for about four hours in El Paso this Sunday, Biden visited a port of entry, a migrant services center, and part of the border wall. But Republicans are calling it a photo op, as Biden didn't actually encounter any illegal immigrants or go to any of the areas where they've been camped out for weeks. The White House told reporters that it was coincidental that there just happened to be no illegal immigrants at the service center when Biden visited. Meanwhile, videos showing camps being cleared out days before Biden's visit. Meanwhile, some Democrats and immigration advocates are accusing Biden of implementing inhumane policies by expanding Title 42. The White House today defended Biden's trip, saying he's committed to treating every migrant as a human being and that the trip, quote, helped him form a more vivid picture of what the administration has done and needs to do. Reporting from the White House, Arus Tao, NTD News. 
We now turn to the turmoil in Brazil. The latest reports have put the number of arrests at over 12,000 as police cleared a camp of protesters outside the army headquarters in the capital today. Brazil's former president Jair Bolsonaro has been staying in Florida since late December. On Monday, his wife said Bolsonaro was admitted to a Florida hospital with intestinal discomfort due to a stabbing he suffered during the 2018 election campaign. People close to him are reportedly saying that his situation is not serious. However, Bolsonaro's diplomatic visa is expiring since he's no longer in office. The State Department said on Monday that individuals in this situation have 30 days to leave the country or request a different visa. Leaders around the world, including from the U.S., Mexico, Canada, and others, have condemned the attacks on Brazil's institutions. Dramatic scenes unfolded in Brazil's capital when thousands stormed the country's seats of government on Sunday. Supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro wrapped in Brazilian flags were seen breaking windows and flooding parts of Congress with a sprinkler system. Rioters were also filmed inside the presidential palace and smashing furniture in Congress and the Supreme Court. Security forces were initially overwhelmed by the protesters. Bolsonaro condemned the attacks on Twitter. He pushed back against President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, known as Lula, who had blamed him for what had occurred. He wrote that, quote, peaceful demonstrations in the form of the law are part of democracy. However, the destroying of and breaking into public buildings has occurred today, as well as those practiced by the left in 2013 and 2017, escape the rule. Meanwhile, Lula declared a so-called federal security intervention until the end of January. Like true vandals destroying what they found in front of them. We think there was a lack of security, and I wanted to tell you that all those people who did this will be found and punished. Mass protests have persisted in Brazil since the outcome of the national election on October 30th of last year. Bolsonaro's supporters doubt the authenticity of the results. They have blockaded major roads across Brazil and demanded that the military step in to intervene. Lula, a socialist, was declared the winner with nearly 51 percent of the vote. Bolsonaro has not publicly conceded, but said in a speech in November 2022 that he would abide by the country's constitution. Reporting by Ariane Pazdar, NTD News. To gain more insight on the protests in Brazil, NTD's Jane Werrell spoke to the editor-in-chief for the Epoch Times Brazil. Hi, Marcos. Uh, thanks for joining us. So, as we've seen, supporters of former Brazilian President Bolsonaro breached the buildings of Brazil's Congress. And it seems reminiscent of what happened on January 6, 2021, in Washington, D.C., where Trump supporters breached the Capitol building. What are the parallels here, in your view? I mean, the parallels are many. Um, they didn't just breach Brazil's uh, Congress buildings. They breached the Supreme Court and the presidential palace, um, equivalent to the Supreme Court and the White House in the U.S. So there's a lot of parallels to be drawn. Um, first of all, um, these protesters, one of the parallels that can be drawn is that many said Antifa and other left-wing organizations might have infiltrated protesters to cause vandalism. And I've been talking directly to protest sources to organizers of the protests in southern Brazil. And what they tell me is that they intended to go there peacefully, but infiltrated people have led the more, more, more radicalized protesters to invade and do acts of vandalism. Um, it's still being investigated. I can't can confirm if that was the case, but that's what the protest organizers are saying about the violence. Now, another parallel I think it's worth drawing is that after January 6th, um, U.S. justice, uh, especially um, the Democrat Party in Congress, did try to get Trump associated to it and did try to indict Trump um, or try to get him not to run in 2024. And what we've seen so far um, is that Lula has already talked about Bolsonaro being allegedly involved, has blamed him for part of what happened. And I think we are likely to see the local left wing trying to stop Jair Bolsonaro from, um, for running, from running to re-election in 2024. I think those are some of the parallels there. What I think is most concerning is the fact that this episode might be used to disenfranchise the whole of the Brazilian right wing, um, which already has moderates after this basically fleeing from that position. Well, for, for President Lula da Silva, what kind of challenges lie ahead for him? I mean, the challenges are huge. Um, Half of the population, about half of the population, um, didn't vote for him. It was a razor-thin victory for him on the second round on October 30th. And a large part of the opposition feel the elections were not legitimate. Let's not forget Lula had been convicted on corruption and money laundry charges. 
and he was released by a Supreme Court justice nominated by the Workers' Party, Edson Fachin. And this Supreme Court justice used to be a Workers' Party activist before he went into the Supreme Court. This was the man who got Lula out of jail, not on the merits of the accusations, but on procedural grounds, that the process um, didn't get the due uh, wasn't conducted in the way that it should. So a lot of people feel that him even running wasn't legitimate. And I think the main challenge to lie ahead is how is he going to get his government to be able to proceed without having to resort to authoritarian law enforcement? Because the protesters um, do not seem to be willing to give in. Very, very hard situation for his administration right now. Well, Marco Schutt, guest uh, editor-in-chief of Epoch Times Brazil, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, Jane. Coming up, California is still storming away, leaving flooded roads and falling trees in northern parts of the state. Authorities say there are now 12 fatalities. And good news from the NFL. Bill's safety DeMar Hamlin is, still n is now back in his hometown of Buffalo. Shen Yun Creations. The streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. The storm continues to rage on in California. The latest death toll is at 12, including two-year-old who was killed by a fallen tree. In a press conference on Sunday, Governor Gavin Newsom said at least 12 people have died from weather-related incidents in California. Uh, it has uh, been a very sad uh, truth. In the last 10 days, 12 people have lost their lives to these floods, 12 people. Again, more than have lost their lives, civilians, that is, uh, to wildfires in the last two years. One is a homeless woman who was killed by a falling tree branch in Sacramento amid torrential downpours and damaging winds on Sunday. Her neighbor, Joe Costa, tried to save her. Uh, my tree, tree part of my house there, it snapped off and, and landed on my neighbor's tent. So I did uh, I immediately went running down there and looked around for her and I started yelling for 911 and uh, the tree was laying on her so I busted her limb off and, and uh, cut open the side of the tent and pulled her out and uh, she was unresponsive and, and her breathing was barely there. Sacramento County issued an evacuation order in Wilton, an area south of Sacramento. The Santa Clara County Office of Emergency Management issued an evacuation warning for those living near Pacheco Pass River Basin and Uvas Reservoir. According to data from PowerOutage.us, more than 130,000 customers were still without power in California as of Monday morning. Forecasters warned that Northern and Central California was still in the path of a, quote, relentless parade of cyclones on Sunday, promising little relief for the region. The combination of an atmospheric river and bomb cyclone have caused devastating flooding and record snowfall over the past week. The National Weather Service said the heavy rain and snow have already caused significant flooding and ground saturation, meaning the next storm to move through early this week would bring an additional flood threat. Signs displayed along freeways highly discouraged travel Sunday night through Monday. President Biden declared a state of emergency for California starting Sunday night. He ordered federal assistance to help with local response efforts from the severe winter storms. 
Thousands of nurses at two New York City hospitals went on a strike today after contract negotiations stalled. And today's Sean Marshall was on the scene of the protests. Who got the power? We got the power. Who got the power? You got the power. More than 7,000 nurses have walked out and are protesting at Montfiore Medical Center in the Bronx and Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan. The nurses are demanding fair, fair wages, they're demanding safe staffing, and they're demanding enforcement of that safe staffing. Since beginning contract negotiations four months ago, the union had been able to reach agreements or new contracts for nurses at seven other New York City hospitals. We cannot have 500 vacancies in our hospital and have no accountability for management not fulfilling those vacancies. Like, how can you have 55 NICU babies and only 16 nurses? That's a very unfair ratio. It's unfair to the babies. It's unfair to the nurses. So that's why we're out here in the street. Nurses gave a 10-day notice on December 30th to give an opportunity to fix the problem by coming to the table and negotiate a fair contract or make proper arrangements. The fact that management decided not to come to the table and have a fair contract, they have failed the community. They have failed the patients. New York City Mayor Eric Adams said on Sunday that he and his staff were closely monitoring the situation and that the city's health care system is prepared to meet any challenges that may arise due to the work stoppage. From what we've heard, the patients are fine for right now. They're on our side. A lot of them have canceled their appointments to be out here with us today because they understand we were, they, we were taking care of them during COVID and they stood by us then and they're standing by us now. Montfiore said the strike forced them to reschedule all elective surgeries and procedures and postpone appointments at ambulatory locations. Mount Sinai said most of its outpatient appointments and procedures are going forward as scheduled. Sean Marshall, NTD News. Now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Sue. College football's national championship game is tonight with defending champion Georgia taking on heavy underdog Texas Christian. The Bulldogs are whopping 12 and a half point favorites, the largest ever for a national championship game in college football. TCU meanwhile has continued to defy the odds. The Horned Frogs weren't even picked to finish in the top half of their own conference, let alone get past Michigan in the semifinals. Should they pull off the upset, they will be the first team left out of the preseason top 25 to win the title since Georgia Tech back in 1990. Georgia, on the other hand, is riding a 16-game winning streak and is looking to be the first repeat champion since Alabama a decade ago. And in NFL news, Bills safety DeMar Hamlin is being discharged from the University of Cincinnati Medical Center and flying to Buffalo to continue his remarkable recovery. The 24-year-old will be hospitalized there as doctors continue to monitor him. Hamlin collapsed during a game last week on Monday Night Football and had to be resuscitated on the field after going into cardiac arrest. But what started as a scary scene turned into a feel-good story as within days, Hamlin was able to grip the hands of family members, breathe on his own, and eventually greet his teammates via video conference Friday morning. The Buffalo Bills wearing Hamlin number three patches on their jersey yesterday beat New England to head into the playoffs as the number two seed. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, besides the NCAA championship game, the NBA has six games on tap featuring the West leading Denver Nuggets taking on the suddenly hot LA Lakers. And finally, for you hockey fans, the NHL has a quadruple header plan, including leading scorer Connor McDavid and the Edmonton Oilers playing at the LA Kings. And that's it for your sports news. Back to you, Sue. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Sue Biamba. Have a great night.
for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.